It's a pleasure to have the, we're gonna try a panel discussion and we're, we're gonna have these folks uh, speak for a couple minutes about their uh, latest and greatest and then uh, then we're gonna open it up for, for questions. And uh, Dr. Paul has even uh, agreed to stay around so if we have questions for him, we can include him in the procedure. So uh, with this, uh, we're gonna start off with uh, Manny Singh. So Manny, uh, and I guess uh, maybe I'll just introduce everybody, then we'll just go along, then it'll be Marty Chivers, Kirsty you know, Eric Olson, Christy, and of course we've been joined by Kurt, Dr. Kurt Psyche. So we will start with you, Manny. All right, good afternoon everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? All right, so uh, I think we have about five minutes or so to talk about. So I'm a cropping systems agronomist at MSU, been here for about two and a half years. So probably know some of you, not all of you. Uh, the project I'm working on uh, with funding from uh, Michigan Wheat Program, essentially all of you guys, is looking at how we can essentially improve the seed placement, right? Because the yield potential is set when we plant, right? So we have a technology to do a really good job with corn and soya beans. But can we improve with small grains, right? I'm talking about wheat, I'm talking about barley. So we are working on project basically, essentially looking at where we are in that technology. And Dennis is, is helping us uh, with, with, with that aspect. And basically, what kind of benefit we, we can get from that, right? So the essentially two ideas we're chasing in there is Basically, can we do a better job with seed placement? So what do I mean by seed placement? I mean singulation. So basically, optimal seed to seed spacing, right? Then I mean basically seeding depth. So getting basically optimal seeding depth, right? And uh, if you all see this uh, uh, handout, I think that all of you have, you can see basically I have a picture of a seed drill and uh, a precision planter. So seed drill right now is pretty much a control spill, right? So we really don't have a good control on seeding depth as well as that seed to seed spacing. To me, the low hanging fruit here is if we can improve our seeding depth by using a better controlling system that will help us basically with the, with the uniform plant growth out in the, in the field. And uh, Paul was talking about that, right? If we can get that uniformity across our growth stages, if we can get to that in thesis and flowering pretty consistently within our field, that will help us in our management, right? Improved management. So maybe we can get a better fungicide efficacy out of uh, uh, the, all the fungicides that, that Paul was talking about. So, so that, 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 that's one, one aspect of looking at it. The, the, the second aspect is coming back to that seed to seed spacing, right? Singulation. And some of you might ask me, basically, why would that be important? Because right now when we, are, when we plant, our seed is sitting right next to each other, right? There isn't much space between the, between the seed within a given row. So how good is a, a, a singulation going to, to be, right? So that's where I think, basically, based on what Europeans have done, Michael Hodge was here uh, at the Crop Summit. Some of you might have listened to him, right? So basically, the idea is if we can go with narrow row spacing and if we can go with the low seeding rate, those two aspects will potentially give us more seed to seed spacing, right? I'm looking for about an inch uh, or so compared to less than half an inch that we have right now. So if we can do that, that's where singulation is going to help out, right? And that way it can help even with more effective tillering uh, within our, our plants, right? So those tillers will hopefully mature at the, at the same time and again give us those uniform crop growth and development for improved and more efficient management. Fungicide comes into, into mind, right? So essentially the overall goal here is that we are looking at this improved seed placement by using these new precision technologies to number one, see if we can improve our yield potential when we are planting our crop, right? Number two, can we decrease our input cost by basically better management of uh, uh, 
our crop growth and development. So those are the, are the two main aspects. Let's see if I'm missing something. So even basically looking into potential of can we use a same planting system to plant small grains and soybeans, right? So that's where some of those long-term economic investments comes into play. And uh, Michael Horch, uh, he, he was talking about basically uh, a unit that they can come bring to the US in future, right? So basically, I think their unit right now plants at six inches. So we can look at maybe uh, what happens if we plant soybeans at around 12 inches or so. So that's pretty much the idea. We have some initial data to look at. Uh, uh, again, we, we need more data to basically justify these hypotheses. But uh, we have plots in, in ground this year. I have a, a graduate student, Calvin Canfield. He's somewhere here in the, in the room working on this project. And uh, uh, hopefully, we'll have some results for, for you here in the, in the next uh, coming months. Basically, after July, we'll have a first real good data coming out of this project. All right, any, any questions before I give it to Marty? Keep your questions. We're going to let these folks uh, have a chance to speak first, and then uh, we'll open the floor to all your questions. And they can be directed to anybody up here. Thanks, Dennis. Um, what I thought I would do is just kind of touch on some of the projects that we've been working on since the start of the wheat program and really just focus on just giving you guys some highlights where you can find the information because, you know, as we start looking at things, there's a lot of things that pops up that might show up in your field and um, a lot of the stuff we've tried to provide that information to you. So just really wanted to highlight some of the things that we've been doing pretty much since the wheat program started. Um, we talked about rough stock bluegrass this morning. Uh, one of the weeds that we started with is uh, common windgrass. We did a lot of work looking at fall versus spring applications and so forth. And pretty much what we really found was to give you guys some good, clear recommendations on how to control common windgrass. And from a standpoint, uh, really we had good luck with fall applications from both either using Osprey or PowerFlex. And we've got a really good fact sheet in the back of the weed control guide that you can kind of look at and see what some of those recommendations are. Another project that we also spent quite a bit of time on is looking at what herbicides can we use for weed control if we're looking at frost seeding red clover. We did a lot of work um, kind of examining most of the herbicides that we can use, whether we're using fall applications or spring applications. We've got a lot of that information embedded into the weed control guide, but just to show you, we've got pretty much looked at most products, um, kind of giving you whether yes, you can use it, whether it should be a caution, or no, don't try it because you're gonna pretty much lose that red clover. And as you look at that, you're gonna see most of the herbicides we can probably use in the fall if we're gonna be frost seeding, and we're very, very limited still on the number of herbicides that we could use from a spring application if we're gonna frost seed red clover. In fact, we're pretty much limited to MCPA, or if we're looking at trying to control a grass weed, we do have that Axial XL product that we can use. Other work that we've done is, uh, you know, in, especially in years like this where we don't have a lot of weed or wheat growth as we're coming into the spring, probably weeds are gonna be much more of a problem. And, and when we run into springs where we can't get out there and get herbicide applications made, sometimes we end up with those weedy fields. So we did quite a bit of work looking at some different pre-harvest applications. Um, Unfortunately, probably one of the best herbicides that we can use to desiccate weeds is actually glyphosate. And you guys heard about some of the concerns with glyphosate. Obviously, we've got those concerns from a dry bean standpoint, also wheat. Um, we're still recommending not using that because of some of those concerns. But when we were doing some of our testing, we actually tested for residues. And the residue lim limits were actually quite a bit lower. We were like 38 times lower than what the maximum residue li limits are. And that's being as a pre-harvest treatment. So, you know, it is, unfortunately, it's just one of those things that we're gonna have to deal with from a political side. And then hopefully at some point we can work through that. But, you know, the science is there. Unfortunately, that's not where the politics are. We did look at some of the other products. Sharpen is one that can be used um, from a standpoint if common ragweed or glyphosate resistant horseweed or mare's tail is an issue, that is a product that could be used to help desiccate some of those weeds. And then uh, finally, we've also done a lot of work kind of comparing 
some of the newer products out there, Talonor, Qlex, and have got some pretty good weed control results. So we've really tried to put that information in the weed control guide so you can kind of compare some of the different products and if you're wanting to try some other uh, new products. So again, I mentioned the weed control guide. We got a whole wheat section, gives you a lot of those uh, key points as well as some of the fact sheets on how to manage some of those weeds. And we do have that up there on the, uh, the website, msuweeds.com. Eric? I don't have slides. Go ahead. Sure. All right. Thank you, Christy. Well, uh, we spoke earlier this morning. I'm a wheat breeder and geneticist at MSU. And of course, we're focused on developing uh, improved varieties. And uh, we also do a lot of things behind the scenes that you don't see in the data tables. We're working to make the breeding cycle go faster. So all of these genetic improvements you saw, we're, we're kind of slow. We're kind of moving over time. We're ratcheting up genetic gain over time. And anything that we can do to make the cycle go faster um, will help with that rate of genetic gain. So we've adopted a lot of new technologies, marker-based predictions. The, the cattlemen in here may know about Zoetis and Kalamazoo, where you can actually do herd improvements with genomic predictions. If you're doing heifer replacements, you can predict traits like milk, uh, milk yield, feed efficiency, and so on. We're, we're at a point where we can, we can take an untested line and predict with fairly good accuracy what its yield potential is, what its scab resistance is going to be before we even go to the field. So that helps us with better decisions, helps us move things along a little faster. Um, there's some other genetic research that we're doing and, and, um, with, with support from you all. Um, finding new traits. So we work on breeding. A lot, uh, yield is very important, but we're also looking at traits like uh, pre-harvest sprouting. You know, we, didn't have, we haven't had a major event since 2011, but we're building in these traits into our breeding pipelines. Um, screening germplasm, characterizing specific genes, getting down to the gene level, you know, the, the wheat. So that gets into some genomics, right? The wheat genome has been sequenced recently. So we can get down to a very precise level and find the actual genes, the elements that are conferring these traits. Um, so that's some of the basic science that we're doing as well as the applied breeding. And so and we also do the commercial testing. So um, all the data, uh, the data is out there to make, better, to make good variety decisions, right? So variety selection can have huge impacts. And I encourage you all to um, do, do your homework, do your diligence um, in finding those varieties um, that are going to have higher yield potential and, and the traits that you need for your production operation. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Martin Chilvis. I'm the field crop pathologist. Um, so I just put a, two slides together, one just to sort of show you some of the research components that we're working on, right? Some of the things behind the scenes that you guys might not really be that aware of. Obviously, we work really closely uh, with Pierce Paul, so he sort of coordinates these multi-state uh, trial protocols and we implement them on campus. And Martin Nagelkirk has been implementing them up here as well. So we've got multiple sort of environments here at Michigan to look at those. Um, I've got a graduate student here with me today, Michaela Brunig, and she's been looking at the actual isolates of the fungus that cause head scab here in Michigan, uh, and also ear mold on corn, so we've got a better understanding of what isolates are out there, and then also their fungicide sensitivity. So just trying to get a hot, uh, ahead, of, ahead of any particular um, issues with respect to fungicide resistance, right? Uh, so that's a project that she's working on. Um, we do a lot of fungicide testing, efficacy testing, so a lot of work with uh, industry partners such as Syngenta uh, helped test their uh, Miraverse product as well. Um, and just something else that you probably won't hear about too much, but um, as an example, we're working with University of Michigan. They've got a uh, new sort of synthesis mechanism to develop different chemistries. And so we're working with those people to see if they've got different, uh, slightly different uh, modifications on some of these fungicides that might have efficacy potentially for head scab management. So just some things you might not sort of see at the front. But uh, We also work a lot with Kurt Steinke's group too with respect to variety uh, selection and fertility uh, and how that affects disease. And I think, you know, Pierce has really covered this. Today, you know, variety selection, number one key in terms of disease management, uh, particularly for head scab, but we don't want to forget about some of those foliar diseases. Uh, certainly scouting, right, and a good example of that would have been that 2016 strike rust ep epidemic that we had. Knowing what is happening in the field is absolutely important, right? Um, 
that, along with fungicide timing, and so Pierce has spent uh, an, a good amount of time on that, and then just fungicide products that we have, some of those new products, uh, including Marivus Mar Ace. Um, so that's what I have. Um, who's up next? Kurt? I'll put your slides up. All right. Uh, Kurt Stanky, wanted to go over just a couple of things. Um, Jody asked, you know, what have we learned over the last several years? I wanted to get about five take home messages. Uh, you know, I'll start with message number five, which is six, because I've been around long enough. I know if I throw a number out there, everyone pads it by 20%. So I figured I'm going to do the same and go with number six. So one plant wheat, it seems, it seems fairly simple, right? Uh, we know small grains increases the diversity. If you look at Michigan agriculture, the strength of Michigan agriculture is the diversity of crops in this state. That's what really helps drive our yield potentials. And so it seems like a no-brainer, but it's one of those things. By planting wheat, we do increase our corn and soybean yields, all right? So that's one thing I wanted to, wanted to, to, to emphasize. Another one, plant timely. Now, we all cannot do that. Rotation's gonna impact that dramatically, and planting date will have a huge impact this spring. Uh, once, once everything melts off, we can get out into the field. Uh, but you can see this is from a couple years ago, the three pictures at the bottom, looking at a third week in September on the left, uh, first week in October, and the last week in October, uh, planting date the following April. Tremendous impact, tremendous impact on tillering, tremendous impact on plant development. And the other thing I wanted to throw out there, you know, if you want to increase wheat acreage in the state, a lot of us are focused on yield, 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 yield. But if you start looking about at, at, at production agriculture, about feeding the world, etc., it really boils down to can we produce more calories per square foot than other crops? That's what's really going to gain momentum with increasing wheat acreage. And so I think personally that needs to be a greater focus uh, moving forward over the next several years. Number five, sulfur. It's not, I'm not going to say it's a no-brainer, but we have less S today than we've had in previous years. We need to move on a little bit. We know it's deficient. It's more commonly deficient. All right, we don't want to keep saying, oh my gosh, this is a new thing. Well, we've seen S deficiencies for probably 15, 16, 17 years now. So we don't want to say this is new. It's something we need to address. It's not nitrogen. We don't need it in the same amounts, the same quantities. With wheat, we're looking at probably in that 20 to 30 pounds to the acre wheelhouse, all right? Uh, but it can be fairly dissimilar in year-over-year -year response. You can look at 2017 and 2018, 2017, 25 units of S. We had about a 10 bushel increase across the board, and it was flat at rates beyond that. 2018, zero bushel increase. All right, it was flat at the get-go. So it's one of those things we're not going to see response each and every year. But when you start looking at what you're going to apply, either in the fall or here in the spring, 25 units of S is a fairly smart uh, approach to take with regards to your nutrient management plan. And rotations, maturities, and the amount of liquid versus snowfall precipitation that we get in the winter will impact some of those year-over-year uh, -year responses. With nitrogen, you know, we always get the question, should you apply it once, should you apply it twice, should you apply it three times? We have a study going on right now looking at weekly N applications, about nine weekly N applications. That did not work very well last year, but last year was last year, this year is this year. What we have seen over the years, we've seen a benefit to split N in one out of the last seven growing seasons. Okay, and that goes all the way back to April of 2013. In April of 2013, we got about eight and a half inches of rain. Right, and that is what drove the benefit to seeing that split N application. So. If you're planted timely and you're tillered, most of us can probably wait to about feeks four or feeks five to get the bulk of our N out there. And the timing of that first N application is really going to impact the success of those later N applications. And planting date's going to matter greatly. Okay, if you get in on time, you get tillered in the fall, even with our soft reds, we've been able to cut down to about 70, 75 pounds and get 120, 125 bushel wheat. All right, but, there's always but, plant third week in September, and we had probably two, three, four tillers, probably more towards the three or four tillers in that fall going into winter dormancy, and we didn't have a lot of ice cover, et cetera, that uh, following winter. Number three, start right to finish well. Been preaching that across all field cropping systems. 
you got to get that start rate capacity uh, uh, developed in that plant early in the season to capitalize on those mid and late season growing conditions. The interesting thing is we're finding we always think if we plant late, we might need more nutrients all right, to get that plant up and growing out of the ground and developed. Well, it's kind of what we're seeing is opposite. You got to have something to uptake those nutrients that you apply. So we're seeing a better response with those earlier planting dates to some of those starter N, starter S, and P and K applications that we go out in the fall. And again, planting date will have a, a, a very large impact on the response of that starter. Here's something we grabbed uh, from uh, last year. You can look at, uh, at about 0.9 million seeds to the acre, both pictures, with about 250 pounds of 1240 applied uh, in the fall versus no application on the right. We ended up seeing about a 15 bushel increase. All right, so again, doesn't mean you gotta go out at that rate. Okay, we're gonna start backing off that rate and see, see where we can go from there. And at a normal population, we saw a very similar effect, about a 10 bushel increase. And this was everything planted, uh, I think, around September 24th. So we can see benefits there. Question for 2019 is gonna be what you see up on the screen. How is a late planted, water soaked, poorly emerged wheat stand gonna look and respond to autumn starter this spring? We should get a great comparison between winter of 18 or a, a fall of 18 and fall of 17 going into spring, planted on time with starter. We know what those results look like. Last year, we planted on time. Everything was up in three days. We got five inches of rain. Everything died in the next four days. Waited 10 days, we planted again. Waited another six or seven weeks. Turkey day came, wheat came through. Wind came, desiccated the wheat. We got nothing showing out there right now. So it's one of those things, you get a big gut ache at night. Is it or is it not going to come up this year? So we should get a very good comparison uh, between years. Number two, do simple better. Don't overthink some of the basics of nutrient management. There's lots of options and lots of things to do out there, and it's not one size fits all. You know, I, I teach in the fall, students always want, what's the recipe to grow wheat? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I'm out of here. I know how to do it. It's going to change year to year. Okay, even nitrogen rate is going to change year to year. There's not that standard recipe. The other thing, start looking at profitability. Growers should perceive profit loss as a greater risk than yield loss. Because we're always afraid we're going to lose something. Right? We're going to lose something. We're gonna, so we're going to take this, this, this risk aversion approach and add a little bit more of A, B, and C. So it really comes down, are you a risk taker or are you risk averse? And some of us may not know, right? So in three weeks when the golf course is open up and you got a 14 foot putt, that's a great time to figure out if you're risk averse or a risk taker. Because if you got a 14 foot putt, guess what? You got exactly a 50% chance of sinking that putt. 14 foot one inch, it drops the 49%, believe it or not. So you got that 14 foot putt for a birdie, what do you do? Do you slam it in the hole or do you take that cautious approach? All right, so think about things like that and apply that to production agriculture. We don't like losing things, but we also don't like small gains. Eh, it was only a bushel, eh, I don't want to do that again. But if you're worried about losing a bushel, you might do two or three other things, right? For a loss that may or may not happen. So look for those, those types of tools. Use your diagnostic tools that are out there to justify your input applications. You know, Marty's got some great disease models. Look at your nutrient loss mechanisms. Look for a susceptibility to plant lodging, those variety trials, variety trial results. Study those. Don't just take what's on the top. Look for some of those plant characteristics, such as plant height, to determine whether you may or may not need something like a plant growth regulator. Uh, and, you know, a good rule of thumb, if you do not see a nutrient deficiency, you should not expect to see a response to that nutrient application. Okay, it's a good rule of thumb to go by. If you don't see some of these, these, these disease occurrence, nutrient loss, lodging, we end up doing these prophylactic input applications. Okay, the, the, these what if some of these preventative approaches that are out there. And number one, I'll wrap up with this. I feel like I'm going back in time about, uh, let's see here, about 40 years to the early 80s. Don't guess soil test. Know your soil. All right, I can't emphasize that enough. One, use the correct soil test especially for something like phosphorus, if you're a higher pH, okay, you might have to consider that, that Olson P method and look at your soil test report. Okay. Surveys are out there that show growers probably 
less than 50% of growers currently look at their soil test report. All right, look at that soil test report and know how to interpret and understand that report. The other thing, know your soil profile. How many of you, uh, of you in here know your soil depth? No one looks at soil depth anymore, right? And there's a direct correlation between soil depth and yield. And all the soil maps are digitized in the world. So when you go home tonight and go online, Google the Web Soil Survey, you can hone in on your field, and you can find some of those characteristics while you're sitting here in your easy chair, filling out your bracket for the Spartans to go all the way starting tomorrow, right? Do something like that. Uh, know your realistic yield potential. You know, I, I go through this every fall with the students. You know, what's your corn yield potential? 300 bushel, right? Some say 400. How many times have you achieved that? Silence. No response. Okay, you should achieve that yield potential one out of two years. All right, so go back, look at those crop records, and have you. Because if you're not, you will always over-apply nutrients. And then we end up with some of these water quality issues that we're currently dealing with. And lastly, look at your soil pH. That is one of the starting points with nutrient management. It seems outdated, but soil pH can really dictate soil biology and which nutrients are or are not available. So I'll wrap it up with that. A few tidbits of advice uh, going into next year. Anybody else speaking? No? All right. Okay, questions from the audience for anybody. You haven't given up, have you? All right, question right here. Uh, question is, what is your company participation for the yield trials? Uh, yes. They've pulled out of most university trials, including Ohio uh, and Michigan. Illinois has 600,000 acres this year. Missouri's got three quarters of a million, so I, that, that, that's inner workings that I, I can't necessarily comment on, but we, we would welcome more participants in the trials. And each state is different. Now, the soft wheat region is, is, is somewhat different. There are a lot of, a lot of company, companies licensing varieties, so the numbers, the seed company, the numbers of seed companies are quite high, um, and there are, there are likely a lot of pioneer varieties marketed under, under different auspices. Um, so. Um, that's not a direct answer to your question. I'm not really sure why that is, um, but uh, I would like them to. Other questions? You got some questions? <laughs> Time for a break, huh, Dave? <laughs> the web soil survey, uh, your whole map of the contiguous U.S. will come up and you start to form a shape over Michigan and after doing that a couple times you can hone in on your specific county, specific half county, etc. And then you click soil map and that will come up and you'll find out exactly what your soil uh, types are across the field and then the characteristics will be hosted on the left hand side of the page. And you can look at depth, you can look at drainage class, you can look at uh, all sorts of how suitable it is for farmland, all sorts of things. So all this has been out there for many, many years with the, the soil surveys that some of us that our CSS grads probably went through with MACMA and Crum and all, all those guys. That's all online now, so you can sit at home and look at it at your leisure. Other questions in the back? So uh, if you put a herbicide on now, what's the chances that a cover crop after wheat harvest? Yeah, after wheat. Is, it safe? is everything safe then? I mean, or oh. husky still going to be? I've seen husky still do some damage and stuff after wheat comes off. Yeah, so a lot of it's going to be de wheat or dependent on the species, right? So a grass species would be fine, but some of the, 
like a clover or something, probably is going to see some damage. A lot of it's going to be dependent on the moisture. Yeah. So are any of the new chemicals, are you going to be able to frost seed in, with spring, spring spraying? Um, no, because most of our, it's one of those things where if, if we were spraying before the clover came up, there's a few of them that would probably be safe. But, you know, usually we got that clover seeded and it's starting to emerge. Um, everything that we've tested, we're seeing that we're, we're killing it in the spring. It's the fall applications that we can get away with some of that. Right here. Do you guys ever do any trials on tillage versus no-till, like seed emergence and yield? Question, question is, have you guys ever done any uh, trials on tillage versus no-tillage? I have not done anything. Does anybody else want to make a comment? No. That, that's I, I think throughout the Midwest, I, and, I, um, and I think a lot of uh, collecting here, it's pretty comparable. It's um, it does surprisingly well. When you look at it, it's going to look a little bit rougher, but in terms of yields, no-till is very competitive. We don't have as much experience as other parts of the country or the other parts of Michigan just because we, we with our rotation. But yeah, there's some real potential and it de deserves a lot more attention, um, especially in this part of Michigan. Our variety trial drill is heavy enough that we can no-till if needed, and, and our uh, the Lenaway County results. If you look at county by county, those that uh, that location is planted no-till each year, and the yield the yields are quite good. Just make a comment if you're no-tilling. The big thing is making sure that if you what depending on what weeds you have, that you're able to control them. So, like for example, if you have something like a a dandelion or something, you may want be wanting to spray something like Roundup before you plant that that wheat because there's not a whole lot of options that are going to control some of those weeds. Other questions? Yeah. This, this year uh, we have what you were talking about, uh, a big difference in our planting dates and uh, some of our weeds barely emerge. If you do the split application, number one, I guess, would you suggest split applying nitrogen in that case? And if you do the early application, would you suggest going out kind of heavy with the nitrogen on that to, to try to give that a little bit of a bump? Question was, with the late late planning, uh, would it be more likely to go with the split application this year? So looking at how wheat looked uh, going into winter, in some cases it didn't look because we didn't see it, I would say yes, probably go a little earlier necessarily a split maybe not um, you know again the benefit of that split application you're only going to know when you're looking at crystal ball and basically know how April does it's going to be excessively wet or excessively dry or normal if it's normal there may not be any reason to go with the split application so I wouldn't necessarily cut back on your end uh, with the late planted wheat and cut back on your end early and plan for a split uh, because you probably will get a little more benefit from a little extra tillering because we don't have much out there right now. So I'd probably uh, uh, plan on, you know, your normal end application. And then as we go into April, if it does turn out excessively wet, you know, we'll, we'll know if we're in a wet hole, a wet pattern, et cetera. That's when you start looking at maybe that extra 20, 30, 35 units or so. Can I, if I can follow up on that, um, with the uh, early... Uh, or, or putting your nitrogen down a little bit earlier, would you recommend um, any stabilizers with that at that time? Uh, on wheat, we have not seen much of a benefit with end stabilizers, um, with urease inhibitors, nitrification inhibitors, uh, and or controlled release end. Uh, you know, one of the reasons there is you gotta have those end loss conditions, okay? Either volatilization off the surface, which you can get with a surface application, or you gotta have those wet conditions to really cause nutrient loss. So, you know, it took a couple years back about eight, eight and a half inches of rain. That year we saw a benefit to nitrification inhibitors, so about a 14 bushel bump, right? But we don't know if you are or are not going to have a wet April, 
And so that's where, where, where the problem really comes into play in predicting those. If we go with a surface application of N, does it make sense to use something like a urease inhibitor? Again, if you get rain within a couple days, you'll be fine. If you don't, you're going to wish you went with it. And so that's where some of that cost comes into play. You've got to factor in the cost, where the price of N, where that's at right now, how much additional that stabilizer may be, and whether or not you're going to see a big enough yield bump to see a benefit from that. With all the stabilizer work we've done on wheat, we haven't seen much of a benefit. Because once wheat starts cranking and growing, it starts taking up nitrogen. Right? We've actually, when we use some nitrification inhibitors, we've actually seen wheat be inhibited. And it keeps that end of that ammonium form too long. Okay? And it doesn't transfer to that nitrate form. And we see uh, less density and probably anywhere from about a 10 to 15 bushel yield decrease. So you can have negative impacts from using some of these compounds also. Other questions? Yeah, back in the back. You guys ever try anything <laughs> radical like chop the parts out of y'all, put the foot of an oar on, and then decide if you should till it or don't till it? <laughs> They're a radical bunch up here, but I'm not sure if anybody's tried that. So, uh, no, I have worked with some growers that they chop corn silage off and they spread manure, maybe not a foot thick, but um, and then they go back and they plant weed in. And so anytime you follow weed after corn, uh, you know, you got to make sure you manage it properly. And usually when corn silage comes off earlier than most of the other crops, so allowing you to plant your wheat earlier, you got to be careful. You don't want to get too many tillers in the fall either. I've seen uh, wheat fields after corn silage have uh, seven and eight tillers in the fall. That's more than what you want. If you have that many tillers in the fall, you're going to need to be paying attention um, to your nitrogen. You don't want to overdo it with nitrogen in the spring because lodging could be a real problem for you. Um, and in that case, you may want to consider a plant growth regulator, Palisade, to reduce your risk for lodging um, if, it, if it really tillers and develops that much in the fall. Because you put a lot of manure on and then you plant your wheat early, um, that crop can take right off and grow uh, like gangbusters in the fall. In a pinch, especially Ohio, there's been some work in terms of applying manure in the spring, liquid manure. And so we did it in uh, the Snover area a couple of years ago. And uh, we pretty much covered that wheat. Um, I think it was uh, 5,000 uh, gallons or so. And it's surprising that it was able to grow through it. So when you get stuck um, on, in terms of be, uh, able to uh, uh, apply it somewhere, we went on the frost this time of year and at two different rates, and uh, it responded to very nicely and displaced the commercial fertilizer. It's not pretty, uh, but it can work. <laughs> hey, Kurt, this is follow up a little bit more. Okay, we know we're going into this spring. We're, we're pretty uncertain what we have out there. So I guess it's kind of a two-part question. When, how long can I wait to put nitrogen on to get the most benefit, trying to get more tillers, right? And then how much do I have to put on? I want to hedge my bets. I don't want to put the whole load on if I don't have to. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we've looked at different end application timings. You know, the, the, the freeze-ups, the Feeks 2 slash Feeks 3, the Feeks 4 slash 5, and then 6, 7, and later. We haven't seen much of a benefit with going later. Now, we don't look at protein all that much, so we haven't looked at that. But going beyond five, looking at that FIG6 six, six, FIG7 application, we haven't really seen much of a benefit. In some cases, we've seen a detriment. Because don't forget, whenever you apply your N, you know, out of sight, out of mind, but you got to get it in the ground, part of the soil solution. It's got to be uptaken by the plant. Right? There's, there's a little bit of a lag time there. If there's going to be a little bit of a lag time where they use 28 or urea. There's about a 7 to 10 day lag time between those two sources alone. So you got to consider some of those factors. So, you know, I, if, if it dries up and we get, you know, we're probably sitting at some of us, Feeks 2, Feeks 3, these freeze-up applications, you can go. But the, the thing you want to keep in mind when you go probably with the freeze-up application, like we, like we like to refer to them as, sometimes you see a benefit to that late end application. If you go with that FIGS 4, FIGS 5, we oftentimes don't see a benefit to that late end application. As far as rates go, it's going to vary year over year, obviously. You know, a good rule of thumb that we've gone with, with our soft reds, is probably shooting for that 90 to 100 wheelhouse. And with our soft whites, it's shooting for that about 125 to 135 wheelhouse. That's where we've seen our, our typically our maximum return uh, overall. 
Thanks, Dave. Other questions? How yes, sir. How early are you recommending the plant? A plant of wheat. How early can you recommend the plant fall? How early can we plant wheat? You want me to take that? I'll, I'll take a first crack at it, and then you can follow up, Eric. Um, so planting wheat, we have the uh, uh, Hessian fly free date. Uh, Hessian fly has not really been a big problem. We do have some barley yellow dwarf in the state uh, that shows up or appears here and there. Um, Paul Gross found some last year, uh, but it's not as big a problem as what it used to be. But that Hessian fly free date is a good agronomic date really to probably target trying to plant your wheat. Uh, in terms of your in fields that you're going to plant wheat into, if you're planting soybeans as the previous crop, I would suggest you plant an earlier maturing soybean uh, in those fields that you're going to put to wheat that fall. Uh, that way maybe you can get that crop mature a little bit earlier and off a little bit earlier so you can get your wheat planted uh, more timely. Because if you think of all of the different management practices that you can do and applications and timing of nitrogen and fungicides and things like that, planting early is, gonna, is something that doesn't really cost you anything that will have the biggest impact in your uh, crop yield. So if you can plant in by the 20th of September or even the last week of September, um, that will increase your yield significantly over um, an October, late October, even into the first of November planting season. So I, the, the fly free date is still, I think, agronomically a, a good day to, to really try to target starting to plant. Does that get at your question? No, oh, I think you nailed it, Dennis. Two things that I wanted to echo was the, the choice in soybean maturity, right? To do your pencil your economics across commodities, across seasons, right? Do do over a couple of years even and, and and factor that decision in. You might you might lose a bit on your soybeans, um, but you do gain quite a bit in yield um, in wheat being able to plant that early. You don't want to plant too early. That I, I also echo the number of tillers. The number you have to feed all those tillers. If you have seven or eight, you know you could be in trouble with, with having to feed all of those, and you get un potentially uneven flowering, and they just draw resources off of that main stem. But I'm just repeating what Dennis has already given at other talks this year. So, so that, we that's saw that in sense. 2016. Remember, some of you did plant the third week of September, and our yields actually slipped a little bit in the thumb, and as they over tillered, our tillers were actually having tillers. And so it's very unusual. Last year we had no tillers almost this fall, but that year we had quite a few. So I would just add that be sure to back off on your seeding rate. And, 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 at, and at September planting, I wouldn't apply any nitrogen. And so um, those are two big things. I, I feel bad when we finally get to plant, or a few guys were able to plant early and probably lost a little bit. Those, those fields are actually turning yellow in the fall. So back way off on that seed population, and I wouldn't use any nitrogen fertilizer. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is, if you plant late in the fall, what kind of population should you target? Um, Do you want to cover this? We would say the same thing. I'm yeah. not sure you can uh, apply enough seed to be too much. I mean, unless you're just going to dump it on the ground, but it, it takes a lot. Probably two, as much as you can afford. 2.0, um, 2.2 million, it really, um, really could take a lot. And I'd like you to experiment two, two falls ago, and some of you have seen this too, and, and, and you don't want to do it on all your acres, but if you're looking at the last week of October, third week of October, um, just, just play a little bit. Cut that rate in half, but cover your um, uh, passes twice. And so cross drill that, and sometimes uh, you can get a really nice response to that. So there we're going with a higher population, but we're giving them a little bit more room, plant to plant because these little seedlings talk to each other. There's a reason when you spill <laughs> on the ground, not, you don't get a heads per unit area or plants per unit area is actually pretty low. They compete. But given that a little bit more space, uh, plant to plant makes a difference. So cross drill or try different strategies that way um, if you have lots of time. <laughs> so your yield components that you're worried about is your number of heads per square foot, how many seeds there is in one head, 
and then um, what the thousand grain weight is of those heads. So if you're late in the season, what happens is you don't, it doesn't have enough time to tiller, so you're gonna put out less total heads. So that's why you increase your seeding rate to compensate for not having as many tillers. Ideally, you wanna get the two to three tillers in the fall, um, but if, if you're too late, like much of the wheat crop in Michigan was last year, yeah, you wanna increase your seeding rate up to that 2.2 2. 2, uh, million seeds per acre. If we see any yellow on the wheat in the fall, is there any benefit to fungicides? No. Yeah, I mean, I think generally it'd be pretty unlikely to see a, a benefit. Do you want to well, uh, you're right. We have not done any. I was just wondering if Pierce has. So you, have you done any fall treatments? We had a grower that did several fields ago, um, again, when we were getting a lots of growth uh, two years ago. And uh, so we, we followed that field in terms of disease levels in the fall, and there was all kinds of them. I mean, in fact, <laughs> he had a susceptible, was to, susceptible to powdery mildew, and so it's been quite a while. This is like the old days in the 80s. You'd walk through it, and you have a pillowing white dust following you with that much mildew. But we couldn't tell that there was, with every split, there did not seem to be a response. Following, though, that weed pressure, and we also had stripe rust in there, that didn't translate into the spring. And so it's hard to um, be real, um, get real motivated about fall treatments. Um, the the only thing I'd add to that too, with any fungicide app, I mean, that's a relatively easy input to leave a check strip out there in the field, right? And I think you guys should be just doing that regardless. Soybeans, corn, wheat. Knowing what your input costs and, and how that pays back. I think that's really important. Yeah, question over here. Okay, the question is on insects. We haven't really covered insects at all up here. I can talk about it unless somebody else wants to jump up. Um, so we typically don't have major insect problems in wheat uh, right now. Um, of the major insect pests, we probably aphids and cereal leaf beetle will be the two key uh, uh, pests. And I have seen damage from both of those. Uh, it's rare that you would get levels to the point where you, you've got to control them. Armyworm is another thing that could happen, uh, and those are very kind of sporadic uh, uh, pests that we, if you get them, you know, you got to be paying attention, and, and the timing is you don't want to wait until they've marched across your field um, to find them. Uh, but, uh, you know, just proper scouting, I guess, to keep, keep track of them and pay attention to, like, to the crop alerts. Um, the field crops team has a, a weekly uh, morning breakfast that they uh, broadcast that everybody's invited to uh, participate in, and you can hear updates on that, on what's going on across the state. And if there's an outbreak of one of these insect pests, um, you'll hear about it there. So, Question over here. Sure, I've got a, a news article that'll be coming out here, um, if I can get it finished by the end of the week here, um, that will address that. Um, the question had to do with uh, if you have a uh, low stand count, uh, what kind of yield potential is that? There's a, I've got a table in that that shows, uh, I think it's 24 plants per square foot um, is equivalent to like a normal yield or 100% yield. If it drops, I think it's 18 to 22, you got, you're at 90 to 95% yield. If you drop down to 15 plants per square foot, you're only at like 70% yield uh, potential at that point. So if you're below that 15 plants per square foot, uh, that's the point at which you might be making a decision, do I just tear this up and, and put it to another crop? Um, but counting your plants per square foot is gonna be important. Uh, you wanna do it in four or five different places in the field. Don't just go in one spot and count the number of plants. Uh, do it in four or five locations. And, what we, were, we just did stand counts yesterday, and I laid out a ruler and measured three foot in a row and count the number of plants. Um, and then you just gotta do a little bit of math to calculate that on a per square foot basis. And um, if you're seven and a half inch row spacing, 
uh, 19 and a quarter inches is equal to one square foot. So if you measured out 38 inches or 38 and a half inches, that would be equivalent to two square foot. Um, but I'll have more on that. Look for that here, hopefully by the end of this week. The biggest problem is you do have to stand back and, and get a perspective from the road too. That's a value. <laughs> uh, sometimes you lose perspective looking down and, uh, um, and so, but if, really if there's 80% of the field there and almost an aerial view sometimes is just as valuable than follow up with plan counts. But I agree, once you're down to nine or 10 plants per foot of row, I don't, like, I don't like the math. I just do that. You know, it's a seven and a half inch rows. Um, but it never happens that way. You, you'll be all over the board. And then I'm also sensitive to if we have skips going across the rows. If you have one row and only has three or four plants and nothing in the next row, well, that's where we really start to slip. But generally, that real, real uh, rule of thumb uh, works pretty well. I, I think in our plots, or and I think in yours too, Right now, the plants are there. They're a little bit heaved and a little bit weak, but um, I think the real issue will be just some of those pockets here and there, and we might just have to look the other way or spread some clover or oats in there to fill them in. All right, question over here. Uh, question, is there any risk of planting wheat in a field that had high vomitoxin corn last year? So one of the things that tends to confuse people is separating the fungus from the toxin itself, right? So the toxin itself will not be moving around, right? It's the fungus that's producing the toxin. So that's just the one point we need to clarify, right? So. Secondly then, yeah, you are obviously planting into a situation where you had high fusarium loads in that corn, so yes, you are going to increase your risk. Uh, I think if we were to try and scale it in terms of uh, factors that are going to you know, drive disease and vomitoxin, variety selection, number one, fungicide use and then rotation. That's, at least that's how I drank them and Pierce is agreeing with me. So, yep. And we, we wouldn't recommend planting into corn stubble, but... Oh, 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 right, right, no. Right, no. Two years out. Two years out, right, yeah, no, you'll be good. So, but, but like as Pierce was talking about earlier, this fusarium pathogen that's a real problem on wheat and corn, it can hang out on soybean roots, dry bean roots, sugar beets. That's where it's a bit of a problem, right? It's just in the environment. But certainly, yeah, if you, you know, if you plant wheat directly in the corn stubble, that's a problem. Two years out, your risk is significantly reduced. Yep. Questions? Any others? Yes, sir. When Martin retires, is he going to keep the same phone number? Yeah, when Martin retires, he's keeping the same phone number, and he'll be on call 24-7. doesn't matter. Dwight knows where I live, so it does, won't help me. <laughs> Otherwise, I would change it. He'll still answer his phone. Actually, I will. Um, it'll be good for me to keep involved a little bit, so I have the same email address, same phone number. Well, you had me on my knees earlier today, so uh, <laughs> I figured that's payback. The real question is, voicemail still Either one worked all that well <laughs> in the past. <laughs> Are there any other questions? All right, thank you uh, specialists for uh, coming out here and answering questions and giving us an update. We really appreciate that very much.